Jim. Hello, love. Bloody hell! Who did this to you? No one. Oh, Jim. No one. Don't worry about it. Just stitch me up. Rejoicing a half oh, and throw the Yeah, we're on that. Oh, so Listen, I, I, you I, dirty bludgers. I, One of your deadbeat mates put a blade to my Jim's face on Sunday night. Not us, Tilly. We love Big Jim. Shut up! Well, I'm glad you love Big Jim because I want you to do a little job on his behalf. I want you to tell the filthy mug that did it that there's plenty more blood in Jim where that came from and they're gonna have to come up with more than that pretty little scratch if they want to keep him down. Scratch, huh? Meet Tilly Devine, vicious drug dealer and razor-wielding queen of Sydney's sex trade. Tonight we meet the real woman behind the legend of Tilly Devine, Madam Razor. Tilly had a violent temper and mercilessly controlled and dominated others. Arriving in Australia after World War I, Tilly fearlessly fought her way to the top of Sydney's underworld, destroying any ideas about women being the weaker sex. Tonight, through first-hand accounts from family members, <laughs> dramatised scenes and expert analysis, we examine the life of Sydney's first lady of crime. Tilly Devine was nothing more than a calculating, sociopathic, evil individual. Her violence was sudden, swift and very, very extreme. <laughs> she fought on the street, she fought in cafes, she fought in the bedroom with husbands, she, um, she fought. I want you out! Now! She had a long, long, long police record. Many, many charges of assault. <laughs> I don't think there was a heart of gold beating inside her breast. I think she was a black-hearted, embittered, extremely cruel, brutal old bitch. Born in a London slum in 1900, Tilly grew up in a world of poverty and violence. A child prostitute, Tilly escaped London by marrying an Australian soldier during World War I. In Sydney with husband Jim as protector and pimp, Tilly returned to prostitution before establishing an empire of brothels. Staffed by girls, she kept hooked on cocaine. Dangerous and volatile, Tilly didn't hesitate to lash out at anyone foolish enough to cross her or Jim. By the time Tilly got to Australia, in 1920, she'd been educated in the school of hard knocks. She learnt that the tough survive and the violent survive. And I think she just internalised those ways of behaving. Between 1921 and 1925, she was arrested 75 times for such things as prostitution, assault, swearing in a public place, affray, bothering members of the public. The most minor little bit of daily friction with Tilly could turn into a fight, could turn into a screaming match. She quickly learned that you had to be as tough as the men in Sydney, and this was extraordinary for that era because there were very few women who did anything other than what they were told in those days. She didn't hesitate to look after herself by throwing punches or even slashing people with razors because for her that was just the way you got by. Tilly had been educated in the school of hard knocks and quickly learned violence was a very effective means of getting what she wanted. She grew up in a very violent part of London in the late 19th century. She had seen people stabbed, cut. This is the home of Jack the Ripper. This would have been fairly normal sort of behaviour in the speakeasies, the grog slice shops, the brothels and even the streets of South London at this time. All she simply did was acquire those skills and, and transport them with herself to Australia. I mean, we're, we're talking about the mid-1920s here. I mean, women were not allowed in pubs. Um, you know, they had to sit outside or sit in the parlour or whatever. And then to have this woman just arrive on the scene and she was taking no truck from anyone. She was out there with a razor in her hand and she was out there to go and hurt someone. That was unthinkable at that time. In the 1920s, the government made it illegal to carry a firearm, so Sydney's gangs quickly adopted the razor as their weapon of choice. A blade terrifies people in a way that even a pistol doesn't. To be a razor 
wielder is to assume a different kind of street identity. People came away needing 30 stitches or, you know, bled to death afterwards or came away horribly disfigured. These razors were a diabolical instrument. They were unimaginably sharp, sharper than any, any kitchen knife that a chef might have, and easily concealed and terrifying. Tilly also was adept with a razor, as the gangsters of Sydney quickly discovered. One particular fellow knew that he was about to be paid back by, by the Divine Gang, and he was sitting at a barber, barber's chair one day, and Tilly herself came in with a razor and slashed this guy's face apart. <laughs> He would have known that he was going to get payback somewhere along the line, but the idea that this woman, this small woman, would come in with a razor and actually do it herself, that's, that's another level. Many of the convictions that she'd, she'd gathered in Australia since she'd arrived in 1920 were for violent acts. So when she slashed Sydney Cork with a razor, it was not out of the blue. It was completely in character for her. To be actually capable of walking in off the street when you see a bloke reclining in a barber's chair and setting about him with a cutthroat razor and slashing his face to ribbons. It's not everyone that can actually do that. You have to have a deeply rooted capacity for violence and brutality. You are fucking mint, mint! Violence is part and parcel of that working culture. It's not like it's, you know, some boudoir somewhere. It's a pretty terrible culture and you get exposed to a lot of awful things. Tilly loved to fight, a habit that lasted a lifetime, and she would resort to violence at the drop of a hat. Tilly didn't absent herself from the action in ladylike fashion. Whether she got a kick from it, we don't know. I think it's likely that she did. She was known for um, her physical violence on the street. She often attacked policemen. She attacked members of the public who looked at her the wrong way. She's endured violence, she understands what it means, she understands the pain, and she's not, she's not afraid at all to dish it out to whoever comes across her pathway. Matilda Mary Twiss, or Tilly as she was known, was born in Camberwell, a notorious London slum, on the 8th of September 1900, in the final year of Queen Victoria's reign. London at the turn of the century was a city divided between the haves and have-nots, and in a world of deprivation and despair, girls like Tilly had few options. Tilly Devine came from a family almost textbook London poor, the London poor of Dickens. London's a city where you could starve to death. There were no social services really to speak of. There were poor houses, so you really had to fend for yourself as best you could. Children spent a lot of time on the streets at all hours of the days and night. In many cases, they were given opportunities to sell sex from a very young age. She drifted into prostitution quite early, which it's a terrible thing. She might have been as young as 12 when she went on the game. Uh, a terrible thing, but not all that uncommon. People were prepared to do whatever it took to get out of the, the grinding poverty and, and hopelessness. So it's not surprising that so many um, women from poor families actually turned to prostitution. A childhood in the slums, followed by life as a prostitute from such a young age, would have left an indelible mark on Tilly. It's a terrible life. She would have exposed terrible exploitation. She would have had no options about how to grow or how to have a reasonable or decent life. No opportunities. She herself may have been a victim of child sexual abuse. It's often the case with people who uh, choose prostitution or are forced into prostitution. They've learned to dissociate and it's something they have learned to do, to tolerate, to put up with. From an early age, Tilly would have lived a double life, split between her home in the slums and plying her trade in Holborn and Mayfair the rich heart of bustling Edwardian London. There she would have had a glimpse into another world, a world of power and money. She would have seen power and privilege that she would not have been able to access herself directly. And there may have formed in her a desire, a want, an envy, a jealousy even of that power and privilege. Any young girl living in a, a very class-divided society as Edwardian England was 
couldn't have failed to be aware of just what a huge gulf there was between the haves and the have-nots. And a lot of people in that situation resolve at a fairly young age, I think, to become one of the people who have, because it wasn't much fun being one of the ones who didn't have. In 1914, World War I broke out and countries around the world rallied troops. London filled with young men keen for glory. For Australia, this was a pivotal moment. The first time it had gone to war as a country and thousands of young men enlisted. The diggers also made quite an impression when they hit London. Well, if you can imagine, London was awash with Australian servicemen who, who'd come over for the, the great adventure to fight the Hun. Australian servicemen um, were incredibly attractive to English women and there's a lot of um, art from the period and people's reminiscences where they talk about the Anzacs in particular as being so much bigger than particularly working class Englishmen who were undernourished. For young girls like Matilda Twist, Australian soldiers were a prime target because they were very, very well paid. And uh, unlike British servicemen, they, they were earning almost double the money that a, that a Tommy Atkins soldier was earning. They also offered the possibility of escape. Escape to a land of sunshine, um, a land of, of men who were larger than life. Tilly, a teenage prostitute working on the Strand, soon caught the eye of an Australian soldier Unfortunately, he was no hero. Jim Devine was an appalling individual. He was uh, violent, he was brutal, he was foul-mouthed, whether he was drunk or whether he was sober. There were plenty of decent Aussie soldiers, but there were plenty of rapscallions in the ranks as well, and Jim Devine was one of those. He was the antithesis of the popular idea of, of the bronzed Anzac. He was anything but that. He was a malingerer, never saw any action. He spent most of his time, you know, either on the run or uh, in the hands of the military police. Aussies did typically tell stories about what big shots they were back at home, which the Brits were happy to believe. And Jim beguiled her with stories of um, his kangaroo farm back in Australia. And she was one, she was hooked. He became her client, and more than that, he became her lover and her protector. Jim was a violent thug, but he also offered Tilly the possibility of a different life. The idea of Australia in the, in the English mind in the early 20th century was a romantic one. It was of sunshine and opportunity and space. So uh, a relocation to Australia sounds like a pretty good idea for a lot of people, and it did for Tilly. I'm not surprised that, that Tilly was attracted to, to Jim, not just because it was useful to have um, a strong man to look after you, but also because it offered some possibility, a real escape from a life that I don't imagine had a lot of attractions in, in England during and after the First World War. Jim and Tilly were married at her local church in Camberwell. After the war finished, Jim returned to Australia and Tilly joined him a year later as a war bride, leaving their son in the care of her parents. Hey, where's Condoblin from here? About 300 miles west. And how do we get there? Well, there's a train. I reckon we'd be better off driving. Have we got a car? Not yet, but I've got a bloke who... Uh, well, get we... me on a fucking train, Jim. I'm not staying in this flea pit. Hold your horses. You can't just lob. Oh, there's a few things we've got to sort out before we go out there. What have you been doing for the past year, Jim? You came ahead of me so you could sort all this out. I've been making a living, that's what. Oh, great, a living. And what you got to show for it? This place? What have you done with the rest of the money you've made? Fair go, love. Hasn't been easy. What, with all the diggers coming back looking for work? Just answer me one question. Is there a farm at Condoblin? You lying bastard! You utter cock! You made me come halfway across the bloody world for a better life! And look what you've come up with! Darling, darling! Calm down, this is all part of the plan. Oh, you got a plan, have ya? A little bit of hardship now means a lot of luxury later. That's the plan. No bloody farm, well, that's just great. Darling, you know what you're good at. You gotta do a bit of work on your back. We get some coin together, we make a life for ourselves here in Sydney. I knew it. Back on the bloody game. You're not seeing the bigger picture, darling. 
with what you've got underneath your skirt and my muscle, we can take this town by the scruff of the neck. So just after the First World War, Jim Devine sails back to Australia and a year later, Tilly follows him out and they're married. But the first thing he does is he pushes her into prostitution again. It's the same old, same old for Tilly, basically. Except now, it's not the Strand. It's easygoing Sydney. And she's got the survival skills of a person who started prostituting at 12 years old in the toughest city in the world. She may well have been disappointed when she found out there was no kangaroo farm. Um, but I think she knew exactly what she was getting into. A little bit of hardship now means a lot of luxury later. That's the plan. No bloody farm. Well, that's just great. Darling, you know what you're good at. I suspect she thought that she was leaving that life behind and coming to a life of comfort in Australia. Um, so if that was the case, it must have been a rude shock for her to get to Sydney and find that Jim was actually expecting her to still be the breadwinner in the family which was actually what happened. With Razor in hand and Jim by her side, Tilly flourished in Sydney. It was a rough world, but she was up to the challenge, racking up conviction after conviction for stealing, whoring and fighting. But Tilly soon tired of doing the hard work herself. And when Jim was jailed for living off the earnings of a prostitute, the next step became clear. By 1925, she was starting to think that it would be more profitable and a better idea for her if she could become a madam and stop working herself and organise other women to work for her. She started investing her, some of the money she made, into a series of terrace houses down in Palmer Street in Woolloomooloo, and she got onto the other side of the game where it was getting other people to do the work while she uh, gained the proceeds. In the early 1920s, Tilly plied her trade on the streets of Sydney before doing a stint in Long Bay Jail for slashing a man with a razor. Unrepented, Tilly emerged from prison with a plan. At that time, it was illegal for men to live off immoral earnings, but the law made no mention of women. The legislators simply couldn't imagine a woman would be wicked enough to run a brothel. They hadn't reckoned with Tilly Devine. It's kind of ironic that a sexist law that um forbade men from running houses of ill repute, opened the door to an entrepreneur like Tilly to open houses of ill repute run by a woman. She's only barely in her 20s herself, Tilly Devine, but she's had years of experience as a prostitute. She knows prostitutes, she knows their clients, she knows how prostitution works, she knows how brothels work, she knows that you need protection, you need punters, and you need to look after the girls. She can do all that. And she also realises that if she gets young girls into the trade and can get them to keep working for her, then that's where the profit is. Unfortunately, she starts to take advantage of and prey on the very people that she used to be one of them herself. What Tilly learnt from her experience of exploitation was that she didn't want to be exploited again. Uh, if there was going to be any exploiting, she was going to be doing it. As she expanded her network of brothels, Tilly also began dealing cocaine. For Sydney was in the grip of a drug epidemic. In the 1920s and 30s, Australians had the highest per capita consumption of cocaine in the world. Used on the battlefields during World War I, soldiers returned with a taste for the drug. And the explosion of the jazz era saw cocaine become a sought after party drug. This is the Roaring Twenties, it's the jazz age, and there's whole new ways of being in public. There's dance halls and dancing, and cocaine seemed to fit very well with that lifestyle. Well, like many of the illicits, uh, including heroin, cocaine was available widely in a range of different uh, preparations. Some of these were for uh, medicinal purposes, but uh, some of them were just, you know, uh, cheap tonics, give you a bit of a kick. Australia, following pressure from the US, criminalised cocaine uh, in the mid-20s. So it went from being something, uh, you know, handed out pretty freely in Sydney chemists to, uh, to an illegal drug overnight. Once it was criminalised, that provides an opening, of course, for illegal activities. And Tilly, again, was right on to that opportunity and became very involved in distribution of cocaine as part of her prostitution business. Always the entrepreneur, Tilly expanded into large-scale drug dealing, 
and started paying her girls in cocaine. Cocaine use becomes rife in the brothels and these girls become Tilly ten years earlier where she's now enslaving them into the very trade that she has finally moved up from and is making her money now out of a whole series of much younger girls working in her brothels, addicted to cocaine and ensnared in an almost um, endless trap. Tilly's empire was based on the worst form of slavery imaginable. The women who worked in her brothels became addicted to cocaine and were forced to sell themselves over and over again to earn their next hit, which they'd have to buy from Tilly. It would have been a vicious circle. Cheers, love. Bye. See you next time. How was your first night? Oh, it's like riding a bike. How many did you see? Seven. That last one was lovely too. I reckon he'll be back. Mm, good dear, good dear. Oh, the sun's coming up. Might go home and get some shut eye. Oh, that's a good idea, my darling. Oh, you, you'll be wanting to settle up then. Yeah, read my mind. Is that dope? No, I don't use it. You will, darling. But I need readies. I've got rent to pay and a baby to feed. Th this is better than readies, and you can sell it for much more than I can pay you. I haven't got time to sell dope. Oh, it doesn't take much time. Your best customer is lying there on top of you. One snort of this, he'll be wanting to stay all night. That's not the way I want to work. What's your name again? Mabel. You're a pretty girl, Mabel. You want to stay that way? You'll learn to do business my way. But I... Cash is easy to come by, Mabel. Good powder isn't. Everybody here knows that. I know it. The girls know it. The customers know it. Everybody makes a work for them. Don't sell it all, darling. You'll find a little snort helps make the fattest, smelliest, drunkest fellas a little bit more tolerable. Cocaine was the main currency. It was the way she um, paid her girls. It was the way she kept control of them. You give your prostitutes drugs, obviously, they become dependent on you in all sorts of ways, and you've really locked them into a kind of slavery almost then. So it became this vicious cycle for these girls working on the prostitution game. Instead of being paid, they became addicted to cocaine, and it was a very cruel and manipulative thing to do. Forensic psychologists like Stephen Barron have extensive experience of assessing criminals like Tilly and trying to understand what drives them. This is where her being a, an evil woman for me is manifested. She sold these girls a very ugly life and probably a very ugly death. And that was from the time you work for me, you're paid in cocaine, and then you spend the rest of your working life working off that debt to me. She would have just been harsh, manipulative, uncaring, uh, without much in the way of any anxiety. Uh, these are the kinds of traits that you might expect to see in somebody who has psychopathy. She's been through the tough times, she survived, so she probably has no, no sympathy, no sentiment for, for those girls. She needs to control them, and the best form of control is addiction. Is that dope? No, I don't use it. You will, darling. After years of abuse at Jim's hands, Tilly had also learned about the power of brutality. Tilly always grew up in an atmosphere of violence and her experiences with Jim just intensified her appreciation for the value of violence and her skill at using it. There was one documented um, occasion where she beat a girl repeatedly on the face with her fist which was covered in diamond rings and lacerated her quite badly. She slashed other girls who worked for her. She was terrifying. She could have afforded to stop being involved in crime. She was so wealthy, she could have retired at age 30, 31 without, without too many problems. 
but she kept throwing herself back into the fray. By the end of the 1920s, Tilly was a wealthy madam, and as her empire expanded, her relationship with Jim was also subtly changing. Although he was still violent towards her, slowly but surely, she was becoming the one with the power. As Tilly matured, she became more confident in herself. I mean, you've got to remember, she was only 20 years old when she came to Australia. She had a lot of money and she knew how to use not just her propensity to violence, but also her connections. Jim was really basically just a thug. She was a smart thug. Tilly was running a vast prostitution empire and selling huge quantities of cocaine. Pimps on her payroll made sure she got half of each trick her girls turned, and she ran her operation with an iron fist. There was just one cloud on Tilly's horizon, her arch rival, Kate Lee, who ran a chain of backstreet boozers or sly grog shops. The two women hated each other with a passion. This is the only time in modern Australian history where women have been gang leaders in a sense, big. Tilly Devine ran things, and same with Kate Lee. She ran her death. This has only happened once. It hasn't happened since. And that's quite remarkable. They were both competitive women, and so therefore they each wanted to outdo each other. Tilly was brothels. Kate was sly grog, cocaine, shoplifting, fencing, stolen goods. But their gangs hated each other, and if Tilly and Kate met on the street, there would be fireworks. This extraordinary situation arose where Tilly had a, a rival, another female rival in Sydney, in Kate Lee, and she was every bit as horrible as Tilly Devine, and, and this war erupted between, uh, between these two matriarchs of, of Sydney crime, if you like, and, and it was a violent war. Like Tilly, Kate also had gangs of young thugs in her pay, including Australia's first gangster, Chow Hayes. When their gangs met in the street, all hell would break loose. The peak of the Razor Gang period, the late 20s and 1930, and it really was a peak. There was a, an upsurge of street violence and uh, murder and it just became worse and worse and degenerating into these, these enormous street fights with people wielding razors and belting each other to death. And in the 1920s, these razor gangs, these groups of armed thugs who were sort of wielding these cutthroat razors, they just ran amok through the, the suburbs of Darlinghurst and Surrey Hills and Redfern and uh, were terrifying. There was a, a major riot in August 1929 in King's Cross and something like 40, 50 gangsters going at each other with, um, with razors, which was probably one of the worst affrays that Sydney has ever seen. And Tilly and Kate were at the, at, at the end of that. In 1929, while Tilly and Kate fought on the streets, the world was sliding towards a global crisis, the Great Depression. The depression of the 1930s in Australia was very severe. A third of the workforce were unemployed and in some areas, um, particularly working class areas, that figure you know, could reach 50%. So that affected families, it affected women as well as men. And it meant that there was less cash floating around, there was less demand for prostitution, but more reason for women to engage in it. While millions struggled, Tilly thrived during the Depression, getting rich, exploiting women, desperate to make a living. As a family member, George Parsons recalls Tilly enjoyed flaunting her wealth. I remember coming to the house when I was a um, small boy, um, like, like a ship in full sail. A lot of clothes, wore a lot, very colourful clothes, covered in jewels. First person I ever saw that had jewellery on their feet. I remember speaking to a couple of members of her family that um, talked always about how beautifully made up she always was, how beautifully styled her hair was, and how every time they saw her she was wearing furs and she had rings on every finger and she looked very glamorous. She was also extremely powerful and she had a bodyguard with her regularly. He was a charming bloke. We liked him as kids, uh, called Skinny. Um, Obviously, he was far from that. We knew he had a gun, because he had in the shoulder holster. And uh, one day, we were asking him whether we could <laughs> play with it. And he said, no, no, kids, no. And she said, I'll take the bloody bullets out of it. Let the children have it. Tilly may have had the trappings of wealth, but underneath her finery, she was still a vicious street fighter who'd come from the slums. 
Look, I know it's only Balmain, but it's a nice stone cottage. It's close to the city. Christian Brothers have got a good school there, and the price was right. What'd you pay for it? 400 quid cash. Oh, well roared lion. I couldn't have done this without you, Till. Last 10 years have set me up for the rest of my bloody life. That's why I'm taking you out to lunch, all right? Oh, well, thank you for thanking me, but I reckon you've earned it. <laughs> oh, hello. Oh, hello. Give me that. Hey, can you give me that? I need to get a cab on. Looks like we're drinking champagne today. <laughs> she seemed to think that the whole world was there as an opportunity for her. And even, even when she was very well off, she would never pass by an opportunity to pinch something, um, no matter who it belonged to. There's many instances of her simply attacking a member of the public who may or may not have looked sideways at her. Anyone she took a dislike to, she was a powder keg. So she didn't seem to have any sense of um, remorse or that people who were drunk in the street, you know, really shouldn't be exploited. For her, it was almost as though they deserved it because they'd crossed her path. <laughs> I suspect it becomes a habit after a while. The fact that she was rich and she sees a man who's drunk and his wallet is available to her would be a, simply an invitation to pinch it. It would be almost careless not to. The thing about Tilly Devine was, as she got older, she didn't get any smarter. She never lost the basic violent nature that she had. There were many instances reported where she would, at the drop of a hat, exhibit violence even as she was now a middle-aged and older woman, because it came naturally to her. She was the same street smart, street prostitute that she was in London as a young girl. And those skills wouldn't have abandoned her. And she would have slipped the boot in because that's what you did. That's how you maintained your credibility. By the end of the 1930s, Tilly's vice and drugs empire was making her incredibly rich. The London street kid courted respectability and acted as socialite. And when war broke out again in 1939, profits went through the roof. American troops used Sydney as a staging post, and General MacArthur specifically requested that laws governing prostitution be relaxed while his troops were on shore leave. The outbreak of World War II signified the end of the Great Depression. So all of a sudden, the economy had a, a massive boost and there, were, there was money about. And Sydney was again awash with soldiers. Sydney was one of the places where you had not just large numbers of Australian servicemen, but also large numbers of Americans. They had a lot of money and they'd had no women, or very few women of their own, and were very keen to use the services of Sydney's prostitutes. Tilly, uh, she embarked on the sort of salad days for, uh, for her, I guess. She had brothels opening up and she had girls working around the clock. So the money is just rolling in. And what's more, suddenly, um, if there was a blind eye turned towards prostitution and sly grog before, there certainly was during the war because this was keeping the spirits up of the people who were defending the country. So it almost becomes in the national interest. With the money rolling in, Tilly repositioned herself as a patriot and made a blatant bid for respectability, encouraging people to buy war bonds and donating money to charity. What she tried to do was gain some kind of respectability rather than notoriety. And I guess this came from her childhood, her growing up in the slums and wanting some kind of recognition and some standing in society that she'd, she'd actually finally made it and had a sort of cornerstone of respectability about her. It made her feel good to think that she'd become something she couldn't do while she was in London, and that was jump the classes, become someone who had an acceptable level of influence and who could patronise the arts. But Tilly the socialite was living a double life. 
She was managing an empire of prostitutes. She was managing an empire of, of cocaine distribution. She was paying off police officers, judges, politicians. She was paying off the same respectable society that she aspired to be a member of. So this facade of this respectable socialite who'd throw these lavish parties was, just, was completely incongruous with what was going on in the other part of her life. She's parading herself around, uh, you know, dripping with, with jewellery, but at the same time she'd think nothing about belting somebody over the head with this great big diamond ring that she had and, you know, cracking their head open. She was a truly horrible individual. Despite her success, or maybe even because of it, Tilly was still suffering terrible abuse at the hands of her drunken thug of a husband, Jim. There was violence in the marriage. He was, he was a violent drunk and beat her on certain occasions that's been recorded. Jim would come out home and he would just belt her senseless. And to the point where later on, when she was holding these lavish parties and becoming a socialite, she threw a wedding anniversary party for the pair of them and that ended up at the end of the night with Jim splitting her head open. Now, this is nothing new. They've been doing it ever since they met. But it's public, it's in full view of all, you know, all their friends and cronies and associates. Jim Devine holds no, no aura for her anymore. He's just a brutal, horrible, mean-spirited, bad person. And she's jack of it. Tilly, by this point, was at the height of her power and influence, and finally realised she had outgrown her violent, unfaithful husband. The final straw came one morning when Tilly returned from a trip to find Jim wasn't alone. Hey, how about getting us a beer? It's 11 o'clock in the morning, you bludger. You want one? No. Wait here, I've got another fare for you. Hello, Mabel. Bringing you work home, I see. Deal. Wait! Jim! Get your pox ridden old fella out here! Tilly? Well, it's not motherfucking Christmas. Deal, it's not what you think. No? And what do you think I think? She uh, had too much to drink. Oh, shut up, you big oaf, before you get yourself into even more trouble. You tell Mabel you got the jack? Mabel, go. Never darken my doorstep again. Oh, Till, get out of my house! There you go. I want you out. Now! Where am I supposed to go, then? I couldn't give a tuppenny fuck! But you better make up your mind or you'll be going out feet first. So after three decades of being used as a punching bag nearly every night by, by her despicable husband, Tilly says it's over, the, the marriage is finished. When she more or less finds Jim in flagrante delicto, buddying up with the housekeeper, as he says, Tilly flies into a rage, kicks Jim out. Jim, get your pox ridden old fella out here! This starts the ball rolling, what becomes her divorce. This actually marks a turning point where Big Jim Devine is probably past his years by date as far as a fit, young, athletic standover man. Tilly realises this. She's had it with him anyway, and she's basically decided I'm moving on. Jim had outlived his usefulness, and Tilly, in typically bloodthirsty fashion, delivered her signature parting gift in person at the end of a razor. Soon after Jim Devine being slashed after he'd broken up with Tilly, Tilly filed for divorce. When Tilly got off the war bride ship, the Waimoana, in uh, the 1920s, she started hooking for Big Jim. And basically, she played from Big Jim's deck. By the time they split up, three decades later nearly, Jim had nothing. Everything was in her name and she was running it. Um, and she really was the boss. He had nothing. She was able to move on and he was continuing to be the same old kind of character. And that's something that was just you know, dragging her down. And she'd come out of a system where she had become increasingly boss cocky, I would imagine, and uh, didn't need him. 
As the 50s dawned, Tilly was entering middle age and had left her humble origins in a London slum far behind her. She had survived prison, the razor wars, untold fights, years of domestic violence, two world wars and the Great Depression. Although she never lost her vicious temper, Tilly was finally enjoying life. She found love with a new husband, was incredibly wealthy and life was sweet. As she's going into her golden years, Tilly Devine has plenty of money in the bank, she has a good house, she's a well-known Sydney identity. She had many parties um, where everybody would get drunk and sing. She sang the old music hall songs that she used to hear in Camberwell at the music halls. She was also one of those people who was a legendary drinker. She loved a tipple, you know. Tilly's new husband, Eric Parsons, took pleasure in partying and living the good life with her. When her second marriage came about, uh, it was a completely different arrangement. She ruled the roost and she had a, an almost subservient husband. What a change. After all the years persevering with uh, Big Jim and getting belted for her trouble and so on, when she looked around for another bloke, she chose the, uh, the barman at, uh, at her local. She probably figured that he wouldn't be the handful that Jim was, and he wasn't. He was a very understanding guy. Tilly is definitely uh, the leading hand in that relationship now. She's got the money, she's got the reputation, she's got the, the charisma, if you like. And Eric's quite happy um, and, you know, good-natured uh, in his tagging along there. So that seems to have worked quite well for them. Eric Parsons' nephew, George, remembers the gossip within the family when his uncle married the notorious Tilly Devine. I heard a couple of comments made by uncle, my, one of my uncles that Tilly likes sex. This, uh, I remember this comment made, uh, that she liked it herself. Now, Eric was very keen on ladies, so who knows? It, it may have started in that sort of way. From then on, he didn't have to work, which he liked. Their relationship wasn't all a bed of roses. Although Eric didn't have to work, he did have to put up with Tilly's volcanic bursts of fury. Not long after they met, uh, someone shot him. Everyone thinks it's Tilly, and it's pretty hard to think of anybody else. And when the police came after the shooting, they found Eric Parsons in bed and he told them to go away, go away. He said, I'm sleeping off a hangover. What shots? I didn't hear any shots. And so the police were very surprised when they heard that an Eric Parsons had been at the hospital trying to get a gunshot wound fixed. And there's a couple of legends about him. If he was dancing too close to somebody, she'd uh, sort of de deal with him. She once shot him in the knee on the wedding night because he was dancing a bit close to somebody. So it was a nice bloke and uh, very understanding, uh, getting shot out the way he did. Tilly was one of Sydney's wealthiest women and featured in the gossip pages of the local papers. So when she announced a lavish trip to London to witness the coronation of Elizabeth II, the press lapped up the details. Tilly let it be known her trip cost £20,000, or nearly half a million dollars in today's money. The child of the slums was going home with her head held high. It would have been her finest moment. That's when she started to, sh to show this, uh, how English she was. She certainly had no great love for the old country before that. They paid an awful lot of money to get seats on the route. She sent a lot of postcards back to us. It was probably the high point of her life. She'd been to the coronation, she'd waved flags, she'd dressed to that she had her hair done in Paris. She was in love with Eric, her new husband. She, she thought it was big time. It was her, she'd come home and she'd come home now in glory. She was there at the, the big event. Um, she was no longer the, you know, the, the harlot from the streets. Tilly's triumphant tour would be her last. On her return to Australia, she faced an enemy she had no way of fighting, the tax office. Tilly had foolishly flaunted her wealth in a time of post-war austerity. Now she would face the consequences. This is all about trying to pay for these bloody Olympic Games in Melbourne. That's right, dear. I mean, what does nearly 40 years of hard work amount to if they can just slug me with a £20,000 tax bill? £20,000! How's a woman supposed to find that sort of money? Why don't you just drop your drawers and get back to work, you whining mole? You better not be talking to me. Yeah, I'm talking to you, you dirty bitch. But come on, love. No, I'm not going to come on. She's, she's lined her pocket. She's wrecked families and then she comes in here wanting everyone to feel sorry for her because they want to make her pay her way pay my way 
I've worked hard my whole life and put food on the table of hundreds of women who couldn't have fed themselves without me. Don't give me that. You have turned decent women into drug-crazed harlots that their own families won't talk to. And then you swan off to the coronation of Lizzie Windsor. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if you gave Phil the Greek a gobble for ten quid. Well, you ought to give your old man a gobble, and I wouldn't have to. Settle down, dear. Pay your tax, you filthy slut. Come here and say that! In 1953, she actually went to England for the coronation of the Queen, and she made it known fairly generally that she'd spent £20,000 on this trip back to England. And then, strangely enough, the tax department gave her a bill for precisely £20,000. £20,000 in the 1950s is a huge amount of money. That's more than the value of even quite a nice suburban house. Hard money to raise in a hurry, and if she doesn't get it, it's a jail sentence for her. The bottom line was that they levied a £20,000 um, fine on her and payment of back taxes, which necessitated clearing out many of her bank accounts, and she was given a period of time to sell her properties and rings and whatever to pay this enormous bill. With her declining income, um, her increasing age, her health was not good, she'd lost most of her standover men. By the mid to late 1950s, she was well and truly in decline. She was certainly no longer the queen of the underworld. The tax bill effectively crippled Tilly Devine. Worse was to come when her new husband died in 1957. Tilly was becoming a relic of a forgotten world. Her old enemy, Kate Lee, died a year after Eric, and Tilly, shattered by her losses and exhausted after decades of constant fighting, struggled to keep up with the new villains in town. She's tiny, she looks much older than her 60-odd um, years. And then, while she was still trying to run her brothels, she simply didn't have the strength or the motivation or the ruthlessness anymore and was um, easy pickings for the likes of Joe Borg and younger people who came in and took over her area. Organised crime was, was completely reinvented in the 1960s and 70s. And this was a, a level of organised crime that Tilly didn't understand. It was the rule of the gun, the rule of, of organised business. Uh, and Tilly was too old and too set in her ways, so she became subsumed, she became overwhelmed. Tilly was never going to retire gracefully, and she was drinking and fighting until the bitter end. Uh, she was incorrigible to the last. She, as long as the body held out, she was a villain. She was more of a colourful folk hero type villain by that stage, but she was still capable of causing an uproar in a pub, absolutely right till the very end. This is a woman who now is well past her prime, but still, without thinking, immediately resorts to physical violence whenever her temper triggers off. Once she was crippled by the tax office, she simply came back to where she was 30 years before, and all she could do then was live out the success of her reputation. And over time, that reputation becomes less and less. She made the best that she could out of having been brought up in a antisocial or under-socialised way, and in so doing, became a menace. But at the same time, was a person who somehow or other managed to survive. Tilly Devine is, is this, this you could, you, it's a name you couldn't invent. It became a sort of a synonym for sort of colourful Sydney and the sort of the roaring 20s and those days that were long gone and people did soften towards her but they forgot about her. And even when she died, uh, it's said that someone in a Surrey Hills pub proposed a toast to Tilly Devine and nobody bothered to raise a glass. Tilly Devine finally died after a long illness on the 24th of November 1970. The child prostitute from the London slums had lived an epic life. Tilly fought her way to the top of Sydney's sex trade in days when women were seen and not heard. She survived some of the most tumultuous and violent years in Australia's history. Despite her criminality, Tilly always craved acceptance and respectability, but she would forever be remembered by her obituary from a Sydney newspaper, which labelled her a vicious, grasping, high priestess of savagery, venery, obscenity and whoredom. It was a fitting tribute.